And it seems to me that the arts and design are no exception and an integral contributor to that, uh, that ethos at Berkeley. So you all had some great associations in thinking about creativity. I wanted to concretize them a bit, to think a bit more about what that looks like throughout the university. All right, it, exi it, it exists in many forms. It can take place in the exhibition of a painting or in the designing of an app, in playing in a symphony, or in singing in a chorus, or in developing algorithms that compose a piece of electronic music, as the student is doing here. It means creating a sculpture out of whatever material, metal, clay, paper, creating a print, designing a building or a public park, dancing in a studio, dancing on a campanile, <laughs> yes, one or another, <laughs> directing a film, building a stage set, imagining new products and new interiors, designing a costume, and maybe even fabricating materials we don't yet know about through tangible user interfaces. So this list can continue. And as you see, uh, and as I hope that even just this quick snapshot gives you, a sense that we're cultivating here all kinds of traditional art forms, nearly every art form you could imagine, and at the same time also inventing new ones, uh, a, a central part of what we're doing. As it turns out, if you look into the deeper history of UC Berkeley, this kind of creative culture was sown by some visionary leaders for whom it was wildly important, and it actually this uh, sense, it seems to me, the sense of, the, of creativity as a public good, as you all were already brainstorming it, has been central to our history. So in looking back, actually, to some of its roots, I, I've been uh, thinking about John Galen Howard, who was the first uh, real campus architect uh, and served uh, as the chair, the first chair and founder of the Department of Architecture, starting in 1903. Department of Architecture, of course, being one of the oldest uh, creative departments on our campus. Galen Howard was also a poet who was constantly interested in integrating all forms of creative learning and in establishing, as he said, a city of learning west of the Rocky Mountains. I think we can't underestimate how it felt to be somebody who was establishing this university uh, in the very early parts of the 20th century uh, at, in a place that was untested. Also at a time when debates about higher education on the East Coast were roiling, and where a certain kind of division between the mental and the manual uh, divided ideas about what higher education should be. Galen Howard was responding to a certain, we'll leave them unnamed, East Coast universities, where the elevation of the mental uh, uh, to, and the lowering of the manual was considered sort of the, the, the legitimating way to start a university. And that we were aspiring toward the mental and we'll let the vocational classes do something else. Uh, Galen Howard was really interested right from the beginning in integration. And he, I think it's uh, interesting to think about how much he imagined the city of learning to be what he called a systemic education, where both where artistic, technical, and cultural skills are integrated. So that sense of integration, I think, is something that we see actually in throughout our history, a joining of the cultural and the technical, of thinking and making, of reflection and action. It also is John Galen Howard's imagination that brought us some of our uh, central architectural icons, the Sadler Gate, um, the Campanile, Memorial Stadium, and our own iconic Hearst Greek Theater. And now, of course, these are the many other spaces are those we walk through every day and that define our experience of Berkeley. We can fast forward a little bit, actually quickly, <laughs> into uh, the mid to late 20th century um, and think about another visionary leader, Clark Kerr. Many of you may know that Clark Kerr was our chancellor and UC president during a time of tremendous growth of the university and also tremendous political challenge. Uh, as he imagined what he called the multiversity, his way of delineating a university where, of, uh, of an expanded impact um, and expanded inquiry. And as it turned out, 
uh, he, the arts were a central component of what he understood that multiversity to be, or what Essay Chronicle once called him the, a vital protagonist for the arts, where the arts are crucial both for students and also where the university has a central role to play in advancing the cultural life of its community. There's some fun quotes uh, in the blue and the gold around the arts. And as I'll tell you, I'll share one, I didn't put it up here, uh, but I'll read it to you, where he is talking about the need to create what he called the total student, a student who, whose, whose imagination, the fullness of that student's imagination is continually cultivated. And he says at one point, I found out in the recruiting process for new faculty members, faculty members he was trying to attract, that I was meeting some doubts about the quality of the cultural life at Berkeley. He realized he wasn't going to attract the faculty he wanted if he didn't provide it. So he said, what do we need? We need an art museum. We need an auditorium and playhouse. So in making our plans for physical development on campus, we added some important cultural facilities, particularly the Berkeley Art Museum with an attached movie theater, and Zellerbach Hall for lectures and symphonies, and dance performances with an attached playhouse. And it's, of course, that moment of reflection that prompted a renewed commitment to cultural infrastructure in the Berkeley Art Museum with its attached uh, cinema, Pacific Film Archive, with um, uh, his commitment to Zellerbach Hall and the Zellerbach Playhouse. So if we're thinking about this kind of legacy, uh, I, and, and we think about the, the different language that got John Galen Howard or Clark Kerr had to describe the importance of the arts, systemic education, the total student. I think we can hear echoes of that now when we think about creativity in the 21st century, but I also would, su would suggest that we have some new ways of understanding the role of the arts and culture and creativity in education. So let's think a bit about how that functions today. How do we understand the role of creativity in education generally and in higher learning in particular? We know from research, we know from research across all educational fields about the ways in which um, the need for students to be offered alternative ways of doing their learning, whether it is in project-based, not only um, essay form, but in project-based learning that the arts and design so clearly provide, in group collaboration, figuring out how to collaborate, how to join your view with the perspective of another, how to time your collaboration um, in, in, in sequence with and meet a deadline. Multimodal learning, this is a term that's used um, uh, a great deal in education and in the research of many of our leading education professors in the grad school of education, but it's become clear that students do um, their most uh, innovative learning when they work across formats, when they across visual, verbal, kinetic, sonic registers and the capacity to move across all of those registers both uh, increases their capacity for their own problem solving, for their own capacities um, for critical thinking and creative expression. Uh, and it's also or arguably um, a vehicle for uh, expanding their own repertoire of communication. How, how do I um, express myself in an image? How do I express myself in um, a series of words. And thinking about that relationship, thinking about that relationship now in a world that um, where the modulation between one's offline self-expression and one's online self-expression is also increasingly complicated, the, 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 the arts and design fields become central laboratories for doing that expressive work. And I think that it can't be underestimated the, the, the fact that the arts, art spaces provide um, expansive, imaginative, emotionally rich spaces for understanding somebody who's different from yourself, understanding a culture that's different from yourself, uh, the capacity to stand in the shoes of another and, and feel what it might feel uh, like to be there, central to what it is to be a citizen and also something cultivated within artistic spaces and design spaces across the performing arts, across the visual arts, across the literary arts and more. So those are some of the ways I think we have now in the 21st century context for talking about creativity and out-of-the-box thinking. 
I think that they are in the genealogy of thinking about the whole student or systemic education, but they have a different character now. And it's definitely part of uh, the guidelines and templates that we use for thinking about education um, of our students. So within that, and we, as we try to think about the spaces for cultivating creativity, I also find it important to be sure that we don't conflate different types of creative events. So on the one hand, creativity is about inquiry. Uh, it's about investigation. It's also about historical investigation and uh, uh, cross-cultural investigation. So here at the university, a lot of what we do is, of course, propel um, a student interest in doing their own inquiry, but also providing a context where students get a, a deep historical sense and a deeply and rangy global sense of the variety of human imagination and the variety of creative cultures across the world. It's also about encounter. Creative is about getting students to see stuff, <laughs> about getting students in museums, getting students in lab, in uh, uh, poster sessions, getting students in galleries and, and theaters uh, in order to make sure that they have an encounter with varieties of objects and events um, that uh, represent the vast variety of the human imagination. So getting them in and getting them to see what others have made. It's also about making, about giving students an opportunity to make something. Just make something before they graduate. That something, was not, uh, something that was not there before is there, is present after you've taken the risk, after you've been your, given yourself, um, after you've been brave enough um, to charge yourself with transforming the world in some way, in whatever form we, we provide for you. So those are all on my mind as I think about the connective tissue across our, our creative landscape. Let me give you a sense of what some of these avenues and venues are um, that where this linking uh, occurs. So we've learned a little bit. We started to do some stats and we'll, we'll hopefully have more. We know that almost 5,000 students enroll in an arts course um, whether a making course or an inquiry course annually. We know that um, over 7,000 student tickets are purchased or subsidized, um, enabling students to encounter performing arts work at Cal Performances. Over 7,000 or around 7,000 um, attend exhibitions at the Berkeley Art Museum and over 10,000 attend the Pacific Film Archive. That actually barely scratches the surface as we, as we start to think about all of the other venues for encounter, uh, whether it's uh, plays in the theater department or uh, in, uh, chorus performances in the music department, galleries in the art practice department, uh, galleries in college of environmental design, galleries in engineering. We have spaces all over where people are encountering work, and understanding that participation is something that I, I want to um, I want to do over the next year and cultivate more of. All right, we have a very small font here because I actually needed to try to give you just a, a sense of the different types of arts and design organizations we have on campus. Here's a list of, uh, of departments and schools. These are, you would say, the academic departments, the degree granting departments that span all across all art forms, whether in, the, uh, in music, in film and media, um, in architecture, etc. We also have what we call presenting organizations and museums. These are not degree granting programs, but they're central to the life of the campus, whether we're talking about museums like Berkeley Art Museum, or Hearst Museum, or Cal Performances. Then we have, and here's just a partial list, of centers and institutes that are devoted to inquiry in the arts and design. And, and these also become very interesting pathways for doing cutting-edge thinking and making across a range of design fields. And finally, this one is incredibly sobering. When we started to do the count on the ASUC website of the number of student clubs devoted to the arts and design, we found almost 200, uh, adding up the video clubs, the poetry clubs, the uh, digital art clubs, the photo clubs, the tango drumming, the dance clubs, etc. It is an incredible and creative culture. All right, so let's, uh, I just did want to say that even as we think about all of these venues uh, 
for cultivating creativity is, of course, the people who activate them that make, um, that make true innovation. I thought I might just give you a quick sense of some of the alumni who have emerged from Berkeley who are so uh, particularly distinctive. Uh, I don't know, if, do any of you have any sense of alums from Berkeley who, who you would consider to be successful alums in the arts and design? No? Okay, good. Because it's usually one, one or the other. It's sort of like some people are like, oh, I don't think of Berkeley as a place where artists are, you know, is Berkeley, you know, or the opposite. I'll go around and um, I'll go around about in my daily life and I'll find out that some leading figure is a Berkeley grad and nobody told me. <laughs> so I'll just give you a sense and I'll invite you to help anytime you think of you find another Berkeley grad who who you would put in, a, in, our, in this um, umbrella, you, you can tell. Please share it with me. So let's think about some of these alumni, whether they're literary figures, such as Joan Didion, or uh, major international sculptors, such as Bruce Beasley, currently, uh, whose work is currently on the campus, or Mark DeSubro, a big favorite in SS MoMA's collection, uh, playwright uh, and award-winning playwright Young Jean Lee, uh, we have celebrity actors, including John Cho and Chris Pine, who had an alumni reunion when they were both cast in Star Trek. Uh, architects, Julia Morgan, John Galen Howard's mentee, all the way to really wild, amazing architects working today, like Chris Yao, who's working primarily occurs in um, East Asia and Taiwan and China, a uh, uh, Berkeley grad as well. Uh, Alice Waters, foodies, <laughs> foodies and creatives, all the way to Chris Fan, who's also grad and founder of Slanted Door. We have lots of uh, alumni who work in the digital arts field, whether it's gamers such as Jane McGonigal, uh, digital artists and public intellectuals like Tiffany Schlain. And when we think about creativity and out of the box thinking, let's, let's acknowledge that part of what we're talking about is the creativity of our Bay Area culture. And we're thinking about out of the box thinking of the entrepreneurs who who uh, made the Bay Area and Silicon Valley what it is. Whether we're thinking about Steve Wozniak or Eric Schmidt or John Vitelli or Chris Anderson, uh, the, the last two, both founders and then respectively co-editors of Wired magazine, um, and still uh, and very active entrepreneurs today in the Bay Area. The founder of Indiegogo was a Berkeley alum. So many of our grads have been leaders in, you could say, the cultural domain, whether or not they are founding fashion companies, as did Splendor founder Gina Pell, or home design sites, as did One King's Lane founder Alison Pincus, or whether they're leading the largest public arts funding body in the country, as did former cultural commissioner of the city of New York, Kate Levin. This barely scratch the surface, I have to tell you, of alumni who have incredibly distinctive records in the arts and design. Uh, and we'll also, I'll very quickly just tell you that of course those people, the alumni, uh, uh, the alumni that I put forward here, the students that will become alumni later, are, uh, are, are activated and activate a group of incredible faculty. I won't linger on all of them, but let me just tell you, I started to make lists of our recent Guggenheim winners, uh, and think Stephanie Siyuko in art practice, Catherine Sherwood in art practice, both uh, extraordinarily um, national and international records as artists. Uh, playwright, a playwright like Philip Gangatanda, who, by the way, is here joined with Stan Lai, an alum who is arguably one of the most important uh, playwrights and theater directors working in China and Taiwan. Uh, the choreographer Joe Good, uh, the, the uh, jazz composer and music professor Myra Melford, all the way to the School of Journalism where we have Ken Light who has been such a formative figure in documentary photography. Walter Hood is such a formative figure not only in landscape architecture but in the deployment of landscape architecture for community um, activation. Poet laureates like Bob Haas, all the way to the most recent winner of the Kane Prize for the best work in African writing, Namwali Serpel. We have all varieties of, of faculty who work across the arts and technology, whether we think about Ken Goldberg joining robotics with the arts, or about Greg Niemeyer, who uh, does tremendous uh, aesthetically 
um, um, uh, unorthodox visualizations of data as a new media artist, Lisa Iwamoto joining digital design and architecture, Eric Paulos, who is a computer science professor uh, with a tremendous exhibition record as an innovative artist as well, Ron Rael, who is becoming one of the lead innovators in 3D fabrication while also being an architect. So that list could continue, and it is buoyed and supported and buttressed by a range of scholars who contribute to the inquiry into the arts, who give us exposure to um, and uh, deep, uh, a deep, uh, the capacity to deeply analyze a range of creative making across histories and across cultures, whether you're deciding to work um, on, on popular music with Andrew Jones in China, or you're studying uh, the history of jazz or the history of stand-up comedy with Scott Saul, or the capacity of sculpture, the, uh, of, of huge sculpture, of colossal sculpture to transform its environment with Darcy Grigsby. Or I often think about even of Leslie Kirk, who as a classics professor, mined the history of games, who could say the early gaming culture of Athens and its role in producing democratic citizens for which she won um, Carter. So that ethos is everywhere, all throughout, and again, it's supporting making, encounter, and inquiry, with encounter further buttressed by the fact that we have such stunning curators uh, who bring international artists to the Berkeley campus every year, here with Matthias Tarnopolsky of Cal Performances and Larry Rinder, the head of the Berkeley Art Museum. That gives you, I hope, a sense of the panoply, okay? Things look pretty good, right? Things look pretty rich. They are. So why do we even need an arts and design initiative, you might ask, um, if we have all of this going? Well, as I said, this is my, the first lecture um, that I, where I began to put together some of uh, the, 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 these exempla, examples of creative culture. And I have to say that it was um, not hard work to find, but it was, it, was also, it was also the case that there wasn't a ready inventory where we had uh, previously assembled all of this um, uh, alumni activity, all of this faculty activity under this kind of rubric. So what I often think a, a big part of my job will be is, is to do that inventory and to use that inventory to claim Berkeley's uh, uh, creative culture and also to claim its status um, as something that is central to Berkeley's identity, to how Berkeley talks about itself, and to how people talk about Berkeley. So, uh, as I said, I, I mean, in recalling Howard or Clark Kerr, I think of those as very formative moments in the history of the university, and I think of ourselves as entering a new formative moment now for reinvestigating and thinking about the role of a creative life, of a cultural life, in a 21st century education. And that, in, in part, is buoyed by our new leader, our relatively new leader still, Nicholas Dirks, who decided and declared that he wanted the arts to be a central element of his tenure while here as a chancellor. And over the last year or two, many of us as faculty, staff, uh, and students have been telling him what he means by that. Uh, and I think that it was actually a, 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 an incredible, um, uh, uh, I won't say a surprise, but it wasn't entirely, I don't think he entirely uh, was aware of how much we actually have going and how much actually uh, the necessity of finding some kind of integrative function for claiming and um, uh, claiming it and cultivating it um, actually is. So when I think about the Arts and Design Initiative, I'm thinking about six broad tenets that will guide, I think, what this job should be and what not only the job with me, but what the job is for all who are working with us together as ambassadors and as, benef um, as those who benefit um, from this initiative. I think it's about communication. I think it's about sustaining innovation. I think it's about joining and advancing the role of the arts and design on behalf of social impact. I think it's about cultivating the next generation and connecting um, generations in uh, uh, and across in creating intergenerational communities 
And finally, it's about infrastructure and about thinking about 21st century infrastructure of the university. So what do I mean actually about communication? This is where the rubber starts hitting the road in thinking about near-term projects that I think of as very important. One uh, essential thing is, I think, uh, is to figure out communication platforms that allow multiple units and students to find their pathways and avenues uh, uh, to each other. So if I return to this list, I won't show you, but I could show you the fact that all of these units have their own websites. All of these units have their own logo. <laughs> Most of these units have their own uh, mission statement. Okay, So it is partly about thinking about how to create connective tissue amongst all of these units. What can we claim um, by, by placing these units together? Sorry, we call it units. Does that sound wonky? I know. Uh, to place these entities all on the same platform, what is it that how is it that these votes all might rise higher um, when um, placed in the same plane? Uh, a big task, I think, is going to be creating a huge master arts and design website for the campus, one that links to and integrates all of the all of these uh, all of these entities. One that also produces gives opportunities for students to share what they're making and thinking and encountering. And that process of discovery has itself been a really interesting one. Even thinking about what should go into the website, uh, I, I mean, every day I, I turn the corner and I find out about, you know, uh, an artist in residence possibility at the College of Natural Resources. I just was there yesterday. Yes, uh, the two days ago, uh, artist in residence program at Becky Berkeley um, at our um, Berkeley Energy and Climate Institute. And arts are everywhere, and figuring out how to claim it, find it, and make it possible for students to find and faculty to find, find each other, I think is going to be essential um, in creating this website. Um, I have to tell you that a lot of very entrepreneurial students have already been trying to do this connective work on their own. This is a fabulous website created by students who are tracking design clubs and as well as curricular opportunities. We want to uh, use the incredible work that they did uh, and feature the incredible work that they did and expand it. You can also go to the ASUC website and find different ways of sorting and finding different clubs, but again, the connect, how to connect the dots to all those presenting organizations, museums, and departments will be our job. I should tell you that I, I brought this one up, this uh, slide up before. This is Gina Pell, who's, uh, as I said, an alum and entrepreneur in the fashion world, who has actually volunteered to be the creative director for this website. So, go Berkeley. <laughs> uh, uh, and she's giving her time and connecting us and really interested in thinking about this not website, not only as a brochure, but as something that's actively doing and making and remaking the campus. In the meantime, I should let you know that the Arts Research Center, which I also direct, uh, its website is functioning now as an experimental site for expanding and connecting. So if you have an interest now in seeing how we're um, attempting to bring more and more under a wider umbrella or want a sense of progress with, for, for, with the initiative, go to arts.berkeley.edu. Innovation. This was a word that came up at the beginning when we began thinking about creativity. It's a central word for Berkeley. And I think that part of what is so interesting about studying the arts and making, um, the, making in a research university as, such as ours is the capacity for arts and design thinking and making to be joined to every field of inquiry that you can imagine. And that, to me, is the root of innovation, both um, where we're framing Berkeley as a place that advances innovation in the arts and design, but also where the arts and design are propelling innovation in other fields. So there's lots of different ways we might think about that, but I'll just share one rubric that I think is an interesting one to think about. Some of you, um, and that is the engagement uh, between arts, arts, artists, artists, and artistic thinking and our STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. Some of you may have heard of this acronym STEAM. Uh, STEAM, uh, which is an attempt to join the arts with the STEM fields, it was actually an acronym created um, uh, uh, when the chairs and directors of both the NEA and the NSF, the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Science Foundation, 
um, began to think about how much synergy, synergy there was between, you could say, the laboratory cultures of the arts and the STEM fields, and realizing how much the thinking and making of each could galvanize inquiry, inquiry within as well as communication, another word that came up, communication about the innovations of the others. So I think if you have heard of, of STEAM and heard of the movement around STEAM, I think it has had um, six, uh, provocative successes in many places and other places perhaps. We're still quite, not quite sure what's, what it's doing. Arguably it's had a little bit more traction in K through eight or K through 12 education. Uh, where many of you who have uh, students in those grades might be you know, hearing this language, uh, activating science and arts classes. I'm really interested in thinking about what it means in higher education. Um, thinking too, we just had Yo-Yo Ma here, uh, reminding us too, for him, how important this STEAM movement was, and how important it is for really kind of, um, uh, students that are in the pre-college age. But I'm interested in what STEAM is for grown-ups. And I suspect that if we actually start looking at so much of the collaboration that already happens at Berkeley with the STEAM perspective, we might be very well positioned to tell everyone what STEAM for grown-ups might be. Whether we're thinking here, this was a fabulous recent project that joined um, uh, faculty from art practice and engineering in a, in, a, in a workshop and class for rethinking seating, rethinking the chair. Uh, I think that if we start to look at so much of what we already do, even some of the slides that I brought up earlier, whether we're talking about algorithmic uh, musical innovation or um, new app making or tangible uh, user interfaces and the fabrication of new fabrics, we're, uh, we might find that so much of what we do is contributing back and refining, uh, uh, thinking about what the conjunction of the arts and STEM might be. I reminded then of an artist in residence uh, 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 program that we had at one point with the Builders Association. This is a theater company, you can look them up, um, that, that makes new media theater, that uses new technologies to, to reorganize and change the uh, apparatus of the performing arts and to think somewhat deeply about what the live performance form is next to the uh, digital uh, mediated space of the screen. Well, we had, uh, we had the builders in residence with us for a semester, and they built uh, a work, the first version of a work called Continuous City, in collaboration with our students and faculty, and ended up being a collaboration involving 14 departments, uh, where we had uh, actors from theater, uh, from the theater department, we had sound designers from the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies. We had web designers from the uh, EECS program from Computer Science and from the iSchool, students from Art Practice, and the list went on, students from Architecture, uh, all contributing as researchers, as inquirers, as makers uh, to different component parts of this residency. It ended up being that the continuous city uh, circulated uh, to international festivals around the world with UC Berkeley's name on it as a central commissioner and producer. Uh, and again, when you start to look at a project like that, you think they realize how much the arts became a vehicle for activating uh, uh, technology and engineering fields in new ways, and conversely, for changing and innovating in what we understood the performing arts form to be. I think about this also when uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, over at Lawrence um, Berkeley Labs, uh, one of our um, uh, amazing um, leaders, uh, Paul, uh, Paul uh, Alamazados, has in his nanoparticle lab an artist in residence named Kate Nichols, who is uh, imagining new ways of creating color by using uh, nanoparticle, um, uh, nanoparticle research. Or I think about a, a fairly recent work here, Natural Frequencies, perhaps some of you were there. This is a, was a collaboration between a media artist, a roboticist, uh, uh, a new music uh, professor, composer, and the Berkeley Seismology Lab, where the uh, uh, frequencies generated from the Earth's core uh, uh, were wired 
uh, to the bells and to a set and to a lightscape created around the Campanile. And the frequencies from the center of the earth functioned as an improviser and composer of a score that was created on site to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Campanile. So I think about that too as a, as a situation where new technologies and, and scientific inquiry is changing what we think art could be. And at the same time where an artistic project is reconnecting citizens to scientific inquiry and here to um, seismological research in a very palpable but not dangerous um, uh, project. All right, social impact. This one is big for Berkeley, and it's really hard to even begin to uh, uh, represent all of the incredible range of work in arts and design fields on behalf of the public interest. It's pretty much everywhere. Once you start to think about the incredibly diverse student body that we welcome, the communities that we welcome to campus, all of the public programming on behalf of issues of equity, um, whether it be racial equity, um, uh, around issues of economic equity, gender, etc or you think about the ways in which our public service center uh, does its work often via the arts, that so much community-based work of our students invested in public service happens via artistic projects. We just had a reminder of that synthesis even recently at Cal Performances where we welcomed Gustavo Dumel and the Simon Bolivar Orchestra of Venezuela, top-notch, cutting-edge, uh, uh, musicians in their field who are, uh, but that orchestra is also the source of El Sistema, which some of you may know is an incredible music education program that essentially um, provided music education and instruments to every kid, every kid in Venezuela, an incredible a, a democratization of the arts that has been replicated all over the world. So, we had, I think, a really an, an incredible privilege recently to think more about the relationship between arts and social impact last year when we had an artist in residence named Rick Lowe. I don't know, some of you may or may not know that Rick is, a, in many ways, a beacon in the socially engaged art world. His work began over 20 years ago when he, uh, when he uh, moved into a neighborhood in Houston in a neighbor, an African and neighbor, American neighborhood of shotgun houses, and you see those um, those structures there. Uh, rather than, um, as they, many of them were abandoned or in disrepair, and before the sort of steady wave of gentrification moved in, Rick worked to hang on to those structures um, to find uh, uh, ever more sources of funding, creative funding to to rehabilitate them and at the same time joined with community members of all stripes, of all different parts of the neighborhood, eventually creating, long story short, a project, project row houses which combines artist residency programs with a senior center, after school programs, uh, a battered women's shelter, uh, that basically is joining, he, he considers it both an aesthetic project and a political project. Uh, and joins uh, an artistic imagination to a sort of social service center. Rick very rightly received, this time last year, it was this month last year, a MacArthur Genius Award. He deserved it, some of us thought it was a little late. Uh, and his very first public appearance after that was as an artist in residence at Berkeley. So that was cool. Uh, and what he ended up doing was uh, uh, spending 10 days with us in, uh, visiting classes across all parts of the campus in social justice, in environmental design, and the arts, thinking about this conjunction of the arts and social impact. We also took him to different artistic, different communities in the Bay Area. And I'll use this as an example to foreground the importance, I think, of location, of the location of UC Berkeley in the Bay Area, and increasingly on the East Bay, on the East Bay where more and more creatives, more and more designers, artists, entrepreneurs are moving across to the East Bay uh, to be part of a thriving and diverse creative culture, and yes, a more affordable one. But that sense of involving ourselves in our location, of involving ourselves in a broader community was very much active in this project where we took Rick 
to, uh, 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 to public art projects in the city of Richmond um, that a variety of citizens have been um, um, building from the ground up, as well as to Eastside Arts Alliance in Oakland that has an incredible uh, public art project. So what I felt we were doing there is not only helping our campus, our students, but also building bridges between the university and our wider community by providing a, 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 a wise and thoughtful leader in the arts um, with uh, um, uh, the capacity to advise, to connect, to, uh, and, and, and we actually now know that uh, two organizations have since received two major grants in part um, having some references from Rick. So our role as a public university in sustaining a public culture is also something that happens through the arts and design. There's a longer, there's a video of this project if you'd like to see it that I won't show you now, but if you would like to see it, you can find it at arts.berkeley.edu and search for Rick Lowe. Finally, those, both of those projects anticipate the last two um, elements that I think are so important for connecting students, for, con for developing the whole student um, through the arts and design, as well as for making sure that they just simply have access to the arts, whether it's through residencies like that I described with Rick Lowe, or whether it's through another thing that we very much hope to um, get off the ground. We're hoping to create something like a culture pass for Berkeley students, something that would enable them easily and affordably to access the wide range of artistic activity we have going on the campus and in a later stage in, in um, our Bay Area community. So we want to make it easy for professors to add attendance or a field trip to an art event into their syllabus and not have it be a financial burden or some administrative burden. We want to make it easy for, the, uh, rep, for those who are counselors in residence halls to organize a field trip that could be a memory-making field trip for kids. Sorry, for young adults. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that, 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 that provide some um, opportunities for um, connection uh, with each other in an alternate frame. We want to simplify that, and we also want to make uh, attendance and participation in a cultural life a habit. We want students to leave here understanding this to be a habit, a central part of, of what it is to lead a full and fulfilling life as a lifelong learner, uh, and, to, and that this is a key time that we have, we have people to, to enable um, that link to, and to build that habit. Okay, final is thinking about infrastructure. There's so many exciting things already happening here in thinking about 21st century infrastructure. And before an arts initiative, we already were happy fairly recently to welcome the Gene Hargrove Musical Library. Just this last year, we're so privileged to have opened in the Journalism School and in Bancroft Library, the Reba and David Logan Galleries committed to photojournalism. We just opened in August uh, the new Jacobs Des uh, uh, Institute for Design Innovation at the College of Engineering, whose central supporter, Paul Jacobs, articulates fully and passionately his uh, belief in the role of um, the, the necessity of combining engineering, design thinking, and the arts. Uh, over at the College of Environmental Design, Flex Studios, a Flex Studios infrastructure campaign is almost complete, providing more of these kinds of flex classrooms for initiating project-based learning. We have a new plaza on board coming from the College of Environmental Design, where we'll get to gather and socialize and think together and also eat Chris Fan's food. The founder of Slantador, an alum, is opening a restaurant there. Yay. <laughs> and one of the most exciting infrastructural projects we have on the horizon is the forthcoming, is the opening of the new Berkeley Art Museum. Where again, I think we have um, such an incredible opportunity where not only do we have a new amazing museum, that museum with its attached theater, as, as Kerr would have said, but also where we're embedding ourselves in the city of Berkeley. And I think once again, committing more deeply to our location, to vitalizing our location, and to our role as an East Bay institution um, that is, has partnerships with, is sustained by, and sustains a wider ecology in the Bay Area and off campus. 
We have hopes for improving Zellerbach Hall, that hall that Clark Kerr was so proud of, as well as its, its playhouse and many and others, where we're trying to think now, what kinds of infrastructure do we need to press ahead uh, to enable the creativity of the 21st century? And the old BAM PFA is awaiting a new identity. And obviously, we'll be awaiting and thinking, and we'll be percolating quite a bit about thinking about how to reactivate that signature brutalist space. Finally, I am. Uh, this is one smaller project, but it's precious to me. This building is called Linnell Annex, and this is the uh, temporary building that John Galen Howard erected to uh, uh, host his own offices. It was where his drafting tables were. It's where his team had their offices. It's where their project stations and seminars were. There's a little courtyard there. It was where John Galen Howard imagined the city of learning. It was supposed to be temporary, but then John Galen Howard became really famous. <laughs> so now it's a historic site. Uh, but uh, the chancellor has anointed this space to become the central hub of the arts and design initiative. And so um, I'm excited that we have this opportunity to reimagine this space that will be the space for so much other reimagining. We've already begun working with another Berkeley alum, you guys are everywhere, Mark Cavaniero ha is helping us imagine the space and thinking both about how to retain its historical character and also um, create studios, turn um, drafting studios into new media studios to offer a place for convening, for rehearsal, um, uh, studio space, as well as exhibition space that again can be the hub of place of research, inquiry, and making for the initiative that then spins out to our wider campus. So it's exciting to have that possibility on the horizon. Um, and I think about that now, and I think too about whether it's re-inhabiting that building or taking up this position. Um, I keep going back to that fundamental belief in the what and how and why of Berkeley. Thinking again about how Berkeley is um, a place that joins innovation and social impact, about how it is a place that imagines the world by challenging convention to shape the future. Um, and I know that whatever new histories we make or new futures we make will be committed to that conjunction of social impact and innovation and to the belief that creativity is a public good. So thank you. Thank you very much.